Okay, uh, so I guess uh, we, uh, we're good to go. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Maxwell Lechter. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher now in McGill University in Montreal in Canada. Uh, Max is a, uh, originally from Australia and did his undergraduate master and PhD at the University of Melbourne. Uh, worked uh, with uh, Malcolm Ballas and uh, his project at that time was uh, on iron formation and iron stones from uh, South Australia, uh, Namibia and uh, Kingston Peak in Death Valley. And uh, after his PhD that he finished in 2019, he came uh, to Canada as a postdoc uh, with uh, Galen Halverson, and he continued he, as a postdoctoral researcher in McGill now. And uh, I, I guess his main interest in Precambrian uh, ion formations and carbonates, and uh, um, so I'll pass with this uh, to Max. So, uh, Great, thanks, Andre, and yeah, thanks, uh, Alex, as well, for having me on this series. I'm a big fan, been following for a long time, so it's uh, yeah, exciting to be here, and it's interesting to present some of this um, stuff that Andre just mentioned um, under the kind of broad umbrella of Neoproterozoic iron deposits and what they can tell us about uh, what was going on during that time. Um, I've presented uh, sort of most of this stuff before in, in different um, uh, different formats. So apologies if you've seen some of it before. I'm sort of combining two different topics into the one talk. Um, hopefully that sort of uh, all makes sense, but it's kind of interesting presenting to this audience, given that, um, you know, uh, we're also familiar with the kind of background about the Precambrian. So I'm going to start out by, um, well, first of all, just I want to sort of acknowledge that um, I'm going to shout out a few people throughout the talk, um, uh, collaborators, but um, I mean, most of this work was done, um, as, as Andre already mentioned, alongside Malcolm Wallace at the University of Melbourne, um, as well as uh, Ash Hood, who for a lot of the time during my PhD was a postdoc at Yale and is now at Melbourne and uh, my current um, postdoc supervisor at uh, McGill, Galen Halverson. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm uh, gonna be talking about the Neoproterozoic era. Um, so sort of normally start off by explaining why, we, why, why I am <laughs> interested in the Neoproterozoic era. Um, but as I said, this uh, this forum is is quite unique in that I think that we're all quite familiar with with um, why the Precambrian inter is interesting, and we've had a lot of um, uh, excellent talks already on the Neoproterozoic. So um, so I'm not going to really spend too much time on it, but um, sort of four main things that went on in the Neoproterozoic that um, really well changing events that. Um, that we hope, like to hope to understand by looking at the rock record. The first is that the uh, evolution of animals is thought to occur during this time. So just looking at the fossil record here, um, plotted against all of geological time, we can see that there's some potential evidence for life um, in the form of stromatolites and maybe some other potential fossils um, in the um, early uh, to mid Archean. And then there's some um, less equivocal fossils um, by the time you, you get into the kind of sort of Paleoarchean, Mesoarchean, and then there's kind of a big gap before there's any fossils that are complex enough that people generally agree that they probably represent at least some kind of stem group eukaryote fossil. Uh, but then during the, uh, it's not until the latest Neoproterozoic that we see fossils that are big and complex enough that um, people tend to interpret them as animals. Um, and then of course we go into the Cambrian with the Cambrian explosion. So if you look at molecular clock analyses, they all tend to sort of converge on the last common ancestor of all animals evolving sometime during the Tonian to Cryogenian. So, um, you know, it depends on um, uh, how you weight the fossil record versus the molecular clock analyses. But I think that most people would agree that animals probably evolved during the Neoproterozoic at some point. Um, we also have some geochemical evidence for oxygenation of ocean atmosphere system during this time. So potentially a stepwise change in the redox state of surface environments during this time. Um, 
course, oxygenation strongly influences biogeochemical cycling. So this would have had a major impact on pretty much all Earth's surface systems, uh, but also would have had in particular a big impact on the biosphere, given that oxygen is of course essential for things like aerobic respiration and biosynthesis. And so by the time we see fossil evidence for complex animal ecosystems in the, in the well, definitely in the Cambrian and probably in the Ediacaran as well, um, it's assumed that there's probably some sort of base level um, of uh, relatively high oxygen levels that are required to sustain these. Um, so potentially this was achieved during the Neoproterozoic or potentially not, potentially earlier. Uh, of course, the Cryogenian uh, is quite famous for the extreme ice ages of the Cryogenian period. Uh, there's the uh, Sturdian and the Maranoan glaciations, which, um, you know, we've um, even very recently with, with Judy's talk, um, we've heard a lot about. Um, but just quickly, there's uh, sort of geological evidence that there were ice sheets uh, close to sea level and looking at the uh, paleo latitude of these deposits, not only are they found globally today, but they are interpreted to have been deposited down to low paleo latitudes at the time. So uh, this suggests an extreme glaciation where we would have had widespread ice coverage. Um, and this is, has long been thought to have had a dramatic impact on a lot of um, earth surface environments and in particular potentially transformed the ocean redox state. So there's been some geochemical evidence that have been used to support or argue against this, but this is an idea that dates back, um, you know, about, about 60 years now, um, looking at what would have happened if you had um, uh, widespread ice coverage over the oceans and potentially separating the oceans from the atmosphere. And of course, um, such an extreme ice age where you had these ice sheets at low latitudes for potentially tens of millions of years would have no doubt had some impact on the biosphere and potentially has been considered to um, have influenced eukaryotic evolution during this time. Finally, um, supercontinent breakup. We've had you know, a lot of discussion about this in this series as well, where we had during the Neoproterozoic, we had the breakup of Rodinia and the beginning of the assembly of Gondwana. And this has variably been linked to all of those three other things uh, in different ways, potentially uh, linking it to evolution, oxygenation, and glaciation. So basically what I'm saying here is what we've got these four uh, potentially disparate, but major and important uh, events going on in the Neoproterozoic. And any one of these, well, these top three, uh, you know, evolution, oxygenation, and glaciation, you, you know, you could quite easily find at least one paper that um, argues that one of them caused the other and vice versa. And then you can find a paper that suggests that tectonics played a role um, potentially in any one of these, uh, those three things. So um, it's kind of disentangling the cause and effect relationship between these uh, different um, major processes that is what drives research in the near Proterozoic. So the question that I want to address today is how can we use sedimentary iron deposits to help to uh, disentangle these relationships. So why iron? Uh, well, it's abundant in the crust. Um, it's, it's redox sensitive at conditions that are relevant to Earth's surface environments, and which is why it plays an important role in um, uh, global biogeochemical cycles. Um, so what I've done here is potentially uh, kind of uh, But where I've, I tried to simplify it, but uh, the their uh, depiction of the iron cycle and show how um, we have redox transformation from iron two or ferrous iron, which can be oxidized to iron three or ferric iron, and there are various different uh, microbial metabolisms that take advantage of this re these redox transformations. Um, and this can be recorded in various iron minerals of either um, oxidized, reduced, or mixed valence states. And this iron cycling and the local chemical conditions that lead to these redox transformations are considered to potentially be able to be faithfully recorded in iron-rich sedimentary rocks that can be deposited um, when you um, sequester these iron minerals. So by studying uh, ancient iron deposits, we can hopefully get an insight into uh, these conditions at the time that they formed. 
So uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, about iron deposits in the Precambrian uh, before I get into the near Proterozoic. So um, there's been a lot of work that's looking at iron formations. So iron formations here, I've put a definition up as a chemical sediment, which is typically laminated and commonly contains layers of chert. And these are mostly found uh, prior to the Orosirian, uh, during or prior to the Orosirian period. Um, and then here I've plotted up um, this, this figure, which is the kind of the tonnage of iron formations throughout geological time. And there's been a lot of papers that have come out by studying these iron formations because they're generally considered to be uh, relatively robust in terms of um, their geochemistry not being altered by post-depositional processes. So we can uh, you know, inform our understanding of the Archean and Paleoproterozoic. Uh, in the Phanerozoic, we have quite different iron deposits that are a really characteristic feature. And these are known as guodal ironstones. Um, so these have been, you know, you can uh, argue about the definitions and there's been a lot of um, confusion in the nomenclature here, but uh, basically um, here's this a def definition that I'm gonna use, um, seeing as it's my talk, uh, non-siliceous sandy and clay sediments consisting of, uh, well, they're iron rich, so consisting of at least 15% iron and they contain these iron ooids. Um, so the term ooid here is used by analogy to carbonate textures whereby you have these concentrically coated grains. Um, in this case, they are typically coated by um, either iron oxides, which can be either goethite or hematite, and, uh, and or iron silicates, which is typically either berthurine or camosite. And these have been, again, used to inform our understanding of environmental conditions during the Phanerozoic. Um, I should have said that this diagram here um, there, I haven't been able to find reliable tonnage information for these deposits. So here, this is essentially just kind of like a histogram where I've plotted, up, um, well, I, I didn't do it. I, I took it from these um, studies, uh, plotted up individual occurrences of, uh, of iron stones and phanerozoic. Um, but what was the nature and distribution of sedimentary iron deposits in the near Proterozoic? And how can we use sedimentology to better interpret this record? Uh, so again, the nomenclature can be quite confusing. Um, you know, with these terms. So just want to be really clear about the different types of iron formations that we find throughout the Precambrian. Um, so here again, this plot here against geological time, these are individual occurrences. Um, so sort of like a histogram um, and with the span and potential age ranges for these deposits and um, starting out with uh, iron formations, um, which um, can be formed in a range of different tectonic settings. Um, shown in this diagram up here, where uh, you have these laminated or banded iron formations where they have the layers of chert and fine grained iron minerals. Um, and these can be either formed in um, uh, either in shelf or slope settings or in uh, uh, related to tectonic settings like spreading ridges and volcanic arcs, which are re referred to as Algoma type iron formations. Um, they can also be granular and cross bedded um, in these more shallower iron deposits. And these are still have a similar mineralogy to banded iron formations. Uh, and we can see that some, but not necessarily all granular iron formations uh, also feature iron ooids like phanerozoic iron stones. So there's potentially some uh, similarities there. Hence the confusion in the nomenclature. Uh, during the Cryogenian, we see the resurgence of widespread and global iron formation deposition during the uh, Cryogenian period, uh, potentially associated with the Cryogenian glaciations. These are laminated iron oxides um, with the glacial deposits. And you also see some, what I would call, um, and what are some other researchers call, Uodal iron stones in the Precambrian. Um, so these are quite similar texturally and mineralogy to the Phanerozoic examples, so these non siliceous um, uh, sandy and clay deposits with iron ooids. So to start off in the first part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about ironstones of the Tonian period um, and whether we can use these to constrain shallow marine redox conditions during the, uh, the early near Proterozoic. And as far as I'm aware, there's only two examples of Tonian ironstones currently known. Um, one is in the uh, upper Catherine group in the Yukon, um, which has 
uh, not been precisely uh, constrained in terms of its age, but is uh, estimated to be deposited around 850 million years ago. And the, uh, the Chua group in Grand Canyon, which um, is dated to about 750 million years ago. So uh, if we can look at the geochemistry of these iron stones, um, they can potentially, well, uh, iron deposits in general can potentially be used as a paleoredox constraint uh, using a range of geochemical methods. Um, today, I'm, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to be mainly focusing on iron isotopes. But first, before we can do that, in order to use these as paleoredox constraints, uh, it's really important to use sedimentology and petrography to understand their paleo environment and their parogenesis. So I want to discuss uh, what is the depositional environment of these iron stones, uh, how are these fluids formed, and what was their primary mineralogy. Um, as I mentioned, this involved fieldwork uh, in, in two different areas, two very different styles of fieldwork. Uh, the Wernicke Mountains in the Yukon, which was um, led by uh, Galen Halverson and his, his team at McGill, and also the Grand Canyon, which um, I, I sort of got involved in this aspect of the project through Susanna Porter, who's pictured there. Um, so yeah, the depositional environment. Um, so you see, similar to Phanerozoic ironstones, these Tonian ironstones, you see quite a consistent theme emerging in terms of their associated lithophases. So um, you see that they are associated with evidence for periodic exposure, such as mud cracks uh, and carbonates with fenestrae. Um, there's evidence of storm reworking. Um, you get potential tidal features in some cases, such as mud drapes. Um, they're often associated with these cross laminated sandstones, um, which um, in, the, in this case, uh, we're interpreting to represent uh, is, a, is a really depthful environment for these iron stones. Um, so this is a, a figure that I've um, adapted to show that, uh, that sort of the range in interpreted depositional environments for iron stones um, in that they are exclusively, I would argue, interpreted to be deposited in low energy uh, neuritic environments, um, whether this be peritidal, lagoonal, barrier settings, um, uh, tidally influenced settings, potentially deltaic, um, but definitely storm influenced. Uh, so the point here is that they deposited at shallow water depths. And this is important because it's different. Uh, it's potentially speaking to a different layer of the oceans compared to that of the banded iron formations, which were likely deposited a bit deeper. So how did the Uids form and what was their primary So there's been a lot of debate about iron stones uh, and about what the Uids actually represent, um, uh, potentially also with the uh, the carbonate Uids as well. This, you know, some people argue about that, obviously about how they form, but with ironstone ooze, um, the debate really centers around whether or not these represent accreted grains that are deposited as clasts or whether they are more like diagenetic concretions uh, and form in situ in the sediment pile. I would say that there is quite strong evidence from the Tonian ironstones that they were deposited as clasts. Uh, one example here is where they, there's these um, this thin section of these large ooids up in the top right there, where you can see a really clear grain size contrast between the matrix, uh, the quartz grains in the matrix versus the uh, quartz grains that have kind of adhered concentrically to the, um, the ooids that have formed here. You also see evidence of soft sediment deformation. And uh, often you find these larger iron ooids, or um, you might argue that you could call them iron oncoids, uh, where it formed the cores of these iron oncoid uh, composite fragments of earlier iron oncoids that have been broken up and then recoated. So um, I would say that this is evidence that these were clearly forming, um, uh, they, these were syn sedimentary and that they were forming prior to burial. So, what was the primary mineralogy? Well, um, 
what we see in the Tonian examples is that you see interlaminated, uh, finely interlamination, uh, fine interlamination, sorry, between the iron oxides, um, in this case, it's hematite and the uh, um, iron aluminous silicates, uh, in this case, berthrine dominates. And you also see some minor uh, concentric laminae of, of phosphates. Uh, there is, of course, some diagenetic and later conversion overprinting. Um, here you can see the uh, in the top right there in green, you can see the coarser, uh, more magnesium rich uh, phyllosilicates overprinting the berthurine um, and the, the hematite. Um, but and also in some examples which are a little bit more oxidized, you can see the, the entire thing being converted, uh, silicates and all being converted into oxides. But in some cases, you get this really fine interlamination, which I would argue is evidence that they are well preserved and that indicates that both phases are um, primary or at least early diagenetic. And by that, I'm, I mean that um, they, were they were precipitated prior to burial. So the sedimentology and petrography shows that they were precipitated at the sediment seawater interface and that they, these represent primary chemical sediments, um, whereby you probably had fluctuating redox conditions and precipitation of both um, at different times, uh, ferric oxyhydroxides and um, potentially some precursor gel of, of iron, aluminum, and silicon. Um, and then you have uh, various diagenic overprinting and, and, and um, burial diagenesis that goes on, but when you have well-preserved, you can potentially use the geochemistry of these deposits to uh, constrain the paleoredox conditions at the time of deposition. So uh, as I mentioned, I'll mainly talk about iron isotopes today. Um, I just wanna briefly uh, show some rare earth element data from the Tonian iron stones. Um, we've heard a lot about rare earth elements on uh, throughout this series um, and that they have been used particularly in chemical sediments to fingerprint genetic processes. And this applies also to iron deposits. Um, here I've plotted up the shale normalized rare earth element profiles uh, in of the, the hematite and berthurine phases. So these are in situ analyses done with laser so we can target specific phases. Um, and I don't wanna go into too much detail with this, but what I've highlighted here are two anomalies um, so to speak, with the rare earth element profiles when you normalize them to upper continental crust. And that is the positive cerium anomalies and the negative yttrium anomalies. And if you look at uh, more modern or Cenozoic ferromanganese deposits from modern marine environments, um, you can see that there's quite clear difference, particularly in these anomalies, when you look at the rare earth element profiles from those that are considered to be hydrogenetic, those um, uh, precipitated directly from seawater, those that are diagenetic, so pre precipitating as nodules in the um, in the sediment pile, and those that are closely associated with hydrothermal deposits. So you can see that in the hydrogenetic deposits, you see this positive cerium anomaly and this negative yttrium anomaly. And um, those of us who are familiar with looking at seawater rare earth element profiles know that this is uh, kind of the opposite of what you see in uh, so-called modern um, oxygenated seawater. So uh, what this is probably reflecting is exchange between the seawater and the iron deposits, whereby you have the uh, oxidation of cerium and um, the scavenging of cerium by the precipitating iron and manganese minerals. And this is being sequestered into the uh, hydrogenetic ferromanganese crust. And also yttrium is uh, more stable in seawater compared to its geochemically similar neighbor, neighbors, which is why you see an enrichment in, in uh, yttrium, sorry, in seawater and a depletion in the, um, in the iron deposits. And so I would argue that the Tony and Ironstone profiles are most consistent with a hydrogenetic origin compared to diagenetic or hydrothermal. Which, is, which means it can potentially speak to seawater conditions. So, uh, iron isotopes are a really powerful tool where we can use these to potentially constrain the uh, redox conditions of a, um, a precipitated iron mineral. So the way that the framework of why this is a powerful tool is because iron sources are, uh, that, that is uh, potential iron sources to seawater from hydrothermal or detrital sources 
shown here on this diagram. Um, this is in standard delta notation of uh, iron 56. Um, they typically cover a limited range, somewhat close to zero from about negative 0.5 to positive 0.3. Um, and so if we see um, a quantitative oxidation of this iron source, we would expect to see iron minerals with um, that reflect the, the value of the initial iron source. And that would be, uh, again, close to zero. Uh, however, if you have partial iron oxidation, this can lead to uh, equilibrium fractionation, whereby the produced iron oxides are enriched in the heavy iron isotopes relative to, um, to a standard. And so that can potentially lead to fractionation of this iron isotope system when you have partial iron oxidation. Um, of course, this, uh, this partial iron oxidation requires low oxygen because uh, oxygen and iron are, well, are, oxygen and ferrous iron are highly reactive towards each other. So um, in order to get this large spread, um, it's, it's quite a good indicator that you've got um, a low oxygen system. So um, what are the iron isotope compositions of the Tonian ironstones and how do these compare to older and younger Uldal ironstones and other uh, iron deposits? Uh, so this is work that was done with Chang Le Wang and Noah Planavsky. And we looked at um, the two ironstones from the Tonian that I've already mentioned and some older ironstones from the Precambrian, from the Proterozoic, as well as uh, the kind of uh, more better studied examples from the Phanerozoic. So here I've plotted up those data um, along this same geological time plot that I've been showing throughout the talk. And a few things stand out when you see this distribution. Um, that is that if you look at the Catherine group ironstones, which are here in the sort of in the early to mid Tonian and any older ironstones feature these highly variable and positive iron isotope values. Uh, whereas the Chuar group, in the late Tonian and all of the younger deposits are um, essentially indistinguishable from the range of iron isotope values that we would expect from different iron sources. So um, this is potentially indicative of uh, a shift in uh, the genesis, the style of genesis of these ironstones whereby we're shifting from partial iron oxidation to quantitative oxidation. And potentially if this is a secular shift, uh, that would have occurred sometime in the Tonian period. Um, so this is kind of an interesting idea. Um, and there's been some other evidence that something is going on in the Tonian period in terms of a uh, secular um, shift in oxygen levels. Uh, but what does this mean in terms of numbers? Uh, at, you know, at what oxygen level are we talking about you know, when we shift from partial to quantitative iron oxidation? So in order to answer that question, um, we compared these results to those predicted by a model for a kinetic model for uh, shallow marine iron oxidation. So this, um, this theoretical framework, uh, as well as NOAA that I mentioned earlier, um, was kind of developed by Chris Reinhardt, Georgia Tech. Um, and using the way that it works is that it, using a Rayleigh model for um, iron oxidation, which is shown here on the left, just an example. Um, so choosing um, you know, an assumed value of the iron isotope fractionation factor for the combined effects of equilibrium and kinetic uh, isotopic fractionation involved in the transformation from dissolved ferrous iron into the final uh, iron oxide minerals. Um, then what you can essentially do using this, uh, this simple model here is convert iron isotope values, which are shown here on the y-axis to the fraction of oxidation of the uh, ferrous iron reservoir, which is shown here on the x-axis. And so this next diagram in the middle there uh, is essentially just showing uh, the range. If you take each iron isotope value from each iron formations here, I've, for simplicity, I've grouped them into proterozoic, phanerozoic, um, uh, you can see the spread in the range of uh, extended oxidation that is kind of predicted by the um, iron isotope values in the Proterozoic versus the Phanerozoic, whereby um, if we assume that iron isotope values that fall between negative 0.5 and positive uh, 0.3, 
Um, the, you know, the range that I mentioned for the likely sources of iron, if we take those to assume to mean quantitative iron oxidation, then all of the Phanerozoic um, iron stones kind of fall into that range and therefore indicate um, uh, quantitative iron oxidation. So uh, now that we have that range in the extent of oxidation, um, we can compare that to those predicted by the kinetic model. And so what we do is we take a range of different input variables that would affect the extent of oxidation in shallow seawater. So the temperature, pH, salinity, mixed layer depth, residence time, and run that um, through this kinetic model in the bottom left there um, for iron oxidation at a range of dissolved oxygen levels. Um, and here I've only shown it at one uh, assumed iron isotope fractionation value. Um, but we, we ran it at, a, at um, three different values for that. So quite a, a large spread in that. And what we see is that um, uh, even with a really generous range in all of these different input variables, uh, we can run the model, um, you know, we run it stochastically at the, the, this wide range. And here is the output of these um, extent of oxidation here on the y-axis versus three different um, levels of um, atmospheric oxygen levels relative to the modern, so 0 0.1, 1%, 1%, 10%. And if we compare that to those predicted by the um, iron isotope results, what we see is that in order to get the, uh, the partial oxidation that we, uh, that we see and the iron isotope values from the Proterozoic, we really need quite low oxygen levels, probably at or below about 1% of modern levels. Um, and again, we see some of some other evidence. I, I apologize for this uh, this nightmare plot, but um, you know, if you just look at, I don't really want to uh, go into the details of this, but if you just look at a bunch of other uh, proxies, there some of them show evidence for some kind of dip around this same sort of time period. So here, uh, zinc isotopes, chromium isotopes, iodine and carbonates, and so on. So potentially, this is reflecting some kind of um, shift around this time. And if we can take those values predicted by the kinetic model um, of about you know 1%, potentially lower, uh, this is a really interesting value because, and I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with this uh, contentious debate, is that once, once you get down to these low levels of atmospheric oxygen and therefore low levels in shallow seawater, um, it's around the point where it starts to get interesting in terms of um, the oxygen demands of early animals. And I'm not gonna get into that debate too much. Um, and we've already heard a fair bit about that, but uh, what potentially this could be, um, this evidence of oxygenation during this time might contribute to is that uh, we, you know, we do see some evidence for uh, increase in diversity during the Tonian. Um, of course, this, this kind of crashes off in the late um, Tonian um, here shown by this uh, taxon richness diagram, but we also see um, some new innovations in the eukaryotic fossil record. So we see the first ever uh, biomineralizers in, um, in the Tonian of, of these appetite scale microfossils. Uh, we also see testate amoebae. And so these are showing that these fossils, these, uh, these organisms are creating these defenses and they, some of them showed uh, drill holes, which has been argued to suggest that we have evidence for eukaryotic predation during this time. Uh, eukaryotic predation is an oxygen intensive process. Um, so potentially what we're seeing is that this increase in oxygen that is suggested by the ion isotope record um, is potentially allowing uh, more eukaryotic predation during this time. And this may have contributed to um, to evolution and diversification during this time. Um, and you know, we've already heard in this seminar series that there's some other evidence for animal life um, to pro proposed during this time. Um, for example, Liz Turner's uh, recent report of, of fossils from the little dial group, which may represent some uh, fossil sponges. And then there's also the, the biomarker record as well. So uh, that's kind of, um, the idea that potentially what we're seeing is oxygenation during this time, and this may have had some influence on eukaryotic evolution during the, the Tonian period. 
So uh, that's all well and good. Uh, we have this evolution diversification during the Tonian period. Maybe we see the evolution of animals during this time, but uh, it's all interrupted by this, these massive ice ages that I mentioned earlier. And these are also, um, these ice ages are associated with those iron formations. And one of the early ideas uh, for the genesis of these iron formations is that they represent uh, global ocean anoxia. And we know that there are several lineages of um, eukaryotic fossils that are, that are extant. So we know that some of the, that these lineages must have survived the glaciations. And we know that some of these are obligate Arabs. So um, if we had ocean anoxia, this could have potentially represented a problem for these um, aerobic heterotrophic eukaryotes. So what can these iron formations tell us about uh, ocean redox conditions during the near protozoic? So um, I've seen a few of these around the world that they're widely distributed, but for today, I'm going to be focusing on uh, just three examples, which uh, the deposits from Northern Namibia, South Australia and Death Valley. So, um, and this work was done with, uh, with Malcolm Wallace, Ash Hood, as I mentioned earlier, and also with Ganching Jang at UNLV. So just a quick sort of recap of glacial sedimentology in terms of um, interpreting what we're looking at, uh, um, because I really want to try and look at these iron deposits and, and see what they can tell us about uh, glacial conditions at the time. So uh, very broadly, if you look at glacial marine environments, you can classify them into three different um, facies or three different environments. So the ice contact facies deposited in the terminal glacial environment, where you have these melting ice diamix, tunnel mouth deposits, subglacial till, um, uh, and these are all deposited close to the grounding line uh, where the ice sheet begins to float and becomes an ice shelf. Um, further out to sea, you have uh, the ice proximal fasces deposited in the proglacial marine environment where you have these uh, more uh, proglacial marine deltaic fasces, debris flows, um, and glacial marine turbidites. And then eventually you get into the extra glacial marine environment where the ice distal fasces is, is not too dissimilar from uh, normal full marine fasces and you might get some drop stones or some glacier marine turbidites uh, in, interspersed there. So of course these are uh, transitional um, uh, environments. So what do we see the iron formations? Where were they deposited? So the short answer is that we see these in a really wide range of glacier marine environments. Um, so you see these things like uh, rotated boulders in massive subglacial diamics that the, uh, the diamic itself is actually really iron rich, um, you know, is uh, upwards of 15% iron. Um, but importantly, you get these iron formations really intimately associated and interbedded with uh, massive diamic types, even at the meter scale uh, or at the centimeter scale. So, um, so that is an important observation because it suggests that these were not deposited after glaciation, but were definitely deposited well prior to the end of glacial conditions. And then you see, yeah, the full range, the full spectrum in the kind of uh, glacial marine fasces that you um, that you might expect. So we see these uh, things like uh, glacial marine, uh, glacial turbidites, and um, drop stones, and so on. And I realized when I was making this figure um, that it sort of seems to suggest that you have one fasces for one outcrop locality. So the, the, for example, the, the Namibia are only being the ice contact fasces, um, but that's just because I tried to chose nice photos. Um, it, you actually see the full spectrum um, in all of the study units. So again, here's the King's Peak formation where you have these iron formations intimately interbedded with diamic types, uh, drop stones in, in siltstones in the Tuos formation and so on. So iron formations were deposited in a wide range of glacial marine environments and well before ice age termination. Um, they seem to lack evidence for a proximal hydrothermal or structural control in the mineralization, though um, it's likely that there was some distal hydrothermal input given that a lot of these were deposited in rift basins. Uh, so what can iron isotopes potentially 
tell us about the redox conditions of the synglacial oceans, given that we have this, uh, this widespread and um, potential um, paleo redox landscape that we're dealing with. So here I've plotted the same iron isotope values in red from the um, Uodal iron stones that I showed, discussed before. This is on uh, the same uh, geological time. And I've also added literature data in black for um, banded or granular iron formations from the Archean Paleoproterozoic. And this is just to compare what we see in the Sturdian. Um, so this is, this is some data generated with Noah Planowski and also with Wei Chang Li at Nanjing University where uh, plotted in, in blue there are the cryogenian glacial iron formations. So clearly showing it like this, you can see that this is an extreme event. We have uh, the, not only a really large spread, uh, the, the largest spread uh, seen for any time period, but we also see the highest iron isotope values of any iron formation ever. So this is indicating something strange is going on and is uh, interpreted to indicate um, partial iron oxidation in really low oxygen oceans. But what's interesting is when you assign each iron formation sample to its interpreted uh, glacier marine facies, and you look at the iron isotope distribution in that sense, uh, what we see is that uh, a trend emerges. So in the ice distal facies, you see only really strongly positive um, iron isotope values. And again, this is interpreted to represent uh, partial iron oxidation and uh, low oxygen values potentially consistent with um, isolation from the source of oxygen from the atmosphere. Whereas the ice contact facies are either unfractionated or negative. And this is interpreted to represent um, distillation processes where you have extensive iron oxidation, uh, removal of, uh, of the heavy iron from the ferrous iron reservoir as you oxidize that out. And then eventually when you quantitatively oxidize the, uh, the re residual ferrous iron, you're going to uh, be left with iron oxides that have this negative ionisotope signal. Uh, so this is in indicating a, a greater uh, extent of oxidation and therefore potentially high oxygen levels. And then if you look at the ice proximal facies, then that's that's transitional between those two. And uh, I won't really go into these data too much, but this is just to say that if you look at a number of other potential redox proxies from these iron formations and assign them to their different facies, you see the same trend emerges. So things like manganese enrichment, cerium anomalies, and so on. So this is all supportive of this paleo redox gradient uh, as you, where you have more oxidizing conditions becoming more anoxic as you move further away from the grounding line. So we interpreted this to represent a potential meltwater oxygen source. The logic here is that in modern uh, glaciated margins, um, meltwater produced at the base of ice shelves, um, you know, due to frictional heating or geothermal flux, uh, can contain oxygen, and this is from trapped air bubbles that um, were trapped during uh, snow and ice formation. And this is the case even hundreds of meters below um, the surface of the ice in modern Antarctic regions. Um, the cryogenian, uh, the sedimentology of the cryogenian glacial deposit deposits indicates that they were likely wet based or polythermal regimes, regimes and therefore were influenced by abundant meltwater. And we suggest that potentially this is a kind of pre, uh, a, um, an oxygen source to the synglacial oceans that has not really been fully explored in terms of its significance. Um, kind of pushed this idea a little bit further and got a bit arm wavy um, in terms of what the significance might have been for ecosystems in the oceans during this time. Um, now, this is all obviously very speculative, but um, you know, you, could this oxygen source be important to any um, aerobic heterotrophs during this time? Um, but of course, aerobic heterotrophs don't just need oxygen, they need other things. So looking at analog environments in the modern, um, you see some really interesting things from some really uh, recent studies showing that even hundreds of kilometers from the ice margin, even under hundreds um, of meters of ice, 
you see these really diverse ecosystems of animals, including benthic animals. So these things clearly didn't swim there. So uh, these things are, of course, they're, they're likely getting their oxygen because modern oceans are oxygenated, but they're also getting their food source and their nutrients supplied locally um, because these are hundreds of kilometers from any photosynthetic food source. So yeah, just a, a potential um, idea to consider when discussing refugia for um, heterotrophic aerobes during the snowball earth. And, uh, and that's it. So I'll finish there. And just to say that, yeah, um, iron formation geochemistry, uh, when placed in sedimentological context, can uh, potentially provide valuable insights into ancient environmental conditions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, uh, we now switch to uh, questions. Um, and uh, um, so I start was earlier question by Kalu, and I kind of tacked to it my question and uh, but linked to it. And um, I have two more questions, but I let other people go first. Um, so if anyone has a question, please uh, either raise a hand or unmute your mic. Um, so the first question from uh, Kalu was, uh, um, if there is any effect of diagenesis or void water uh, that could have changed original iron isotopes of iron stones. And linked to this uh, uh, question, uh, I'm wondering what you think about middle ray of uh, hump that you have in your data for hematite and if you have any explanation for it. Um, so yeah, the um, diagenesis is um, is definitely something to consider. So especially considering that ironstones, um, as I showed, have really complex mineralogy in terms of different uh, valence state of the different minerals involved. So um, one potential concern is that uh, that you are during dissimilatory iron reduction, potentially you could be mobilizing and releasing um, uh, heavy iron from the sedimentary pile, sorry, um, light iron from the sedimentary pile and leaving the residual iron heavy, um, which could be argued to potentially be um, the explanation for the heavy iron isotope signals. Um, we. This is definitely something to consider. Um, it's something that we don't consider to have had a strong effect, given that um, typically when you look at modern analog environments, you see that the um, a lot of the iron does not actually, um, when you have a lot of mobilization and there's this sort of benthic iron flux, it actually doesn't uh, enrich the uh, residual sedimentary iron pile that much in terms of its ion isotope signal. Um, and this is even the case for things like um, like shales, so uh, which are somewhat low in iron compared to these iron stones that we're talking about. So these things are quite strongly rough buffered um, during diagenesis. So yeah, there's there's a lot to discuss there, um, but we we think that, um, that just the simplest explanation is that this is representing an, an oxidation signal, um, particularly considering that we we don't see the same heavy values in any of the younger deposits. Um, but yeah, it's it's complicated and definitely more work to be done there, particularly with potentially um, uh, phase specific iron isotope research. So these are bulk bulk rock data that I presented here, but yeah, more work that can be done there. Um, to answer your question, Andre, about the, the middle rare earth enrichment, um, this is something that I have I've spent a lot of time thinking about, and um, so I'd, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on this. Um, it's it's interesting that it's only in the hematite, and yet when you look at um, you know studies of uh, you know more modern rare earth element studies where they are sequentially or selectively extracting the oxide phases, um, it's it's not really seen as far as I can tell in the oxide facies. Um, some other suggestions have been that this is a phosphate signal and you do see phosphates in these iron stones, um, but, but that's not the case in, this, in these iron stones because when you do analyze the phosphates, and you know, they are quite small, the, the phosphates, even with the laser, but when you do analyze them, they're all light rare earth element. 
phosphate, so they're probably uh, monazite. Um, so yeah, I'm not too sure uh, how to explain that. I have been toying with the idea that potentially, um, you know, looking at things like iron seeps and whether you see that middle layer of rare earth enrichment in those. Um, there's not a lot of rare earth element data from iron seeps or, or bog iron deposits or acid mine drainage and so on. Um, in one study, they showed this middle layer of enrichment and often acidic waters have been shown to have this middle rare earth enrichment. Um, so that was one potential um, idea that was that you have this contribution of acidic waters where they might be supplying dissolved ferric iron. Um, but actually in those, um, in those areas, even where you have the, um, uh, the acidic waters, the, the middle rare earth enrichment is just interpreted to be the product of the dissolution of iron oxides themselves. So it's kind of a bit circular there and you don't actually see it in the iron deposits. So, um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not too sure. Okay. Yeah, you should talk about that with Alex. I think he will get back to your email. Uh, but uh, your data lays ablation, right? Uh, for rare That's right. Field. Okay. Uh, so Alex has a question. Um, uh, let's see. It, um, uh, thanks, Max, for a great talk in the Pretrazoic oil einstone occurrences. How common is uh, the iron silicate berthorite chamazite versus green light stilpnomela and minisotite. Uh, what do you think uh, the significance is in this uh, different minerals being present in the oidal iron stones versus some other Precambrian iron formations? And I guess one wrinkle in it with green light stilpnomela and minisotite are metamorphic minerals. So that's kind of one complication, but yeah, uh, if you have answer to for Alex. Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. And um, I guess that's sort of something that um, I tried to hint at in the early discussion of going through the nomenclature and granular iron formations versus iron stones. And, you know, um, at one level, it is just a nomenclature thing. And um, especially the ones that the granular iron formations, they both have uids. So, um, you know, the, you could kind of theorize that maybe these granular iron formations represent something similar to phanerozoic iron stones and that maybe post depositional processes have altered their mineralogy. Um, it doesn't, I, I haven't spent much time looking at granular iron formations. Um, and I know that, uh, that, that you and Andre obviously have spent a lot of time on this. So I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on that. Um, but for, in my understanding, the mineralogy does seem to be quite different, particularly in the chert content. Um, and you're right that the iron silicate, um, the iron silicate, mineralogy is really different. So you're looking at the Phanerozoic, it's always either berthurine or camosite. And then um, from what little data there is of the Proterozoic, uh, so-called iron stones, that seems to be the same. Um, so whether this is um, this represents post-depositional um, processes like metamorphism, um, or maybe some, some chemical conditions at the time of deposition, yeah, um, I would... Um, have to kind of defer to you guys on on your ideas on that um but uh yeah we we don't see a, a lot of we don't see any of of those um three minerals in this one so yeah but the berthurine is an interesting one why that's the case great uh so we have uh, uh two people eva first then when paul and uh, i can come uh, later with my question so you will go ahead um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was just curious if you saw any manganese enrichment in these as well, and if you maybe see patterns in manganese through time. Just by because I was just thinking of that because in, in modern hydrogenetic iron deposits, there these have manganese enrichment as well. I was curious. Yeah, um, that's a good question, um, and that's definitely something that I've looked at. It's interesting you don't see a lot of manganese in this, and that that. That's the same for both the iron stones and for the uh, neoproterozoic, the cryogenian um, glacially associated iron formations. So 
I showed, uh, I think, one plot where you see the trends in uh, manganese to iron ratios, but even then, it's it's really small. So, um, so yeah, potentially for these more um, suboxic to um, uh, you know low oxygen conditions, potentially that's suggesting that these are still below the oxygen levels required to uh, preserve manganese in the sedimentary pile mm -hmm. and potentially getting and an, you know you're burying your iron oxides but you're um, reductively dissolving the uh, manganese um but yeah not too okay. yeah it, oh, it's something thank you. um as to why you don't see manganese enrichments in the phanerozoic um in, in some of them you do but uh, in a lot of them you don't yeah that's a, an interesting question mm -hmm. yeah. nice okay um uh, I guess Paul next. Yeah, uh, Max, uh, thanks for the email. Um, my question concerns the large uh, range in iron isotope compositions for the uh, sturdy and iron formations. And so here's a, here's a crazy question. Do you know anything about the temperature dependence of the iron isotope fractionation? Because I recently uh, uh, calculated the temp water temperatures for uh, the cryogenian snowballs, um, taking into consideration the pressure effect of the thick floating ice, which turns out to be very important. And so the temperatures of the snowball oceans uh, range from minus seven at the termination approximately to about minus 13 degrees Celsius at the, uh, at the sturdy and glacial onset. And uh, so these are uh, much colder temperatures than uh, I think uh, we've previously uh, considered. Yeah, um, I actually saw you present that stuff at GAFMAC this year. So that was a really interesting talk. Um, that's a good question. So um, obviously the, there is a temperature dependence and that at low uh, temperatures, you get more fractionation. So um, as to the difference between say, um, you know, 15 to 35 degrees, um, you know, taking a kind of generous range for Proterozoic seawater versus um, those negative temperatures you're talking about, whether that makes a difference. Um, that's something I have to check against the literature. But yeah, it's, it's a good um, suggestion. Okay, uh, so if you um, uh, know other uh, volunteers, uh, I uh, maybe I go ahead with one or two of my questions. So first one is kind of philosophical, like you use granular formations in to in Tonian to infer oxygen level, and yet uh, this ion formations probably like episodic events related potentially to uh, high hydrothermal activity or something else uh, in ocean. So, uh, so to what degree do you think you can infer oxygen, background oxygen or long-term oxygen level in atmosphere from ion formations that have episode represent episodic events of deoxygenation? So, isn't it something similar to using a Cretaceous? Uh, anoxic events to infer uh, sort of oxygen level throughout an area. Yeah, um, that's a that's a good point. And so, yeah, these something to make clear is that obviously looking at these iron stones, that it's only a temporal snapshot. So we can only talk about that time period, and that extrapolating between them is um, is speculation. And I, I did do some sort of back of the envelope calculations about you know your question, how much iron, if you just supplied a whole heap of iron into your shallow seawater, could you, even if it is in um, gas exchange equilibrium with an oxygenated overlying atmosphere, could you overwhelm that and make the, the shallow seawater suboxic um, or anoxic, um, even with that gas exchange? Can you kind of outcompete uh, the gas exchange and uh, based on you know um, obviously there's a lot of different variables that are involved but um, even using kind of generous range it seems quite difficult to do that so um, I, I think that 
you know, the power of, of oxygen to lead to quantitative iron oxidation um, is something that's quite difficult to overcome. But, um, and in terms of the kind of hydrothermal input into these deposits, you know, another point as well, obviously, is that you don't see that fractionation in the, in the Phanerozoic, so for those ironstones. So, um, and we, we don't see um, for the Tonian examples, you know, much evidence for um, hydrothermal activity, volcanic activity at the time of these. So, um, yeah, I would, I think that the simplest explanation is that you're, you have low oxygen conditions, but um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we can talk about that more. Uh, but you see European, do you see European anomaly in your uh, Tonian or uh, in Tonian granulin formations? No, no although, um, as you pointed out, the middle rare earth enrichment um, makes European anomaly quite you know, tr tricky to disentangle. So, you know, using the, um, when you look at it, you know, you don't see any spike, but sometimes you might get the, the numbers coming out as positive when you use the, the formula for European anomaly. But no, it's it's not a clear European anomaly like you see in, in older iron formations. Okay, and um, uh, other question maybe I missed or misunderstood. Uh, why, why do you, what would be evidence or reason for oxygen coming from bubbles in ice versus uh, having weakly oxygenated ocean and as deep waters up well, you drop iron with positive values and it become progressively more negative uh, as it up well on a, on a shelf. Sort of uh, how you separate these two possibilities or what would be evidence on reason to argue for oxygen coming from ice. Yeah, so I guess one thing is that, you know, you see that huge spread and these really high values. So I think that that, I mean, as Paul mentioned, potentially there's some temperature control there that's kind of ex exaggerating the values. But um, I think that it's quite evidence, you know, something extreme is going on, even in the, um, even in the Archean, you don't see values like this. So, um, and, you know, at, at no point, even when you we consider to have shallow, weakly oxygenated oceans, do you see that upwelling leads to this kind of, um, these results? So, yeah, I think that it was just the, it's, it's really just about how to explain this unique association of evidence for higher degree of oxygenation um, associated with grounding line deposits. And given that you have this, you clearly have a meltwater source because otherwise you wouldn't have these deposits, um, these these uh, ice contact deposits. So to me, it was just um, a, a case of speculation that potentially this meltwater was involved. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Ross Mitchell has a hand, so go ahead. Hey, thanks, Andre. Thanks for a great series. Uh, Max, thanks for an excellent presentation. Uh, the slides were gorgeous. Um, you know, to the last uh, point you were making, uh, if meltwater is such an important uh, factor in the deposition of these cryogenic iron formation, uh, why don't we see um, why don't we see banded iron formation or iron formation? You know, near the end of the snowball. You know, you made a point that. Uh, they occur early in the Sturtian, um, uh, maybe not in the Marinoan. And, you know, this has been a change over decades from, you know, Kirschfink's original idea of the last gasp uh, to what we know is, you know, maybe there are, but we haven't found really uh, many iron formations in, in the last gasp. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've been asked this question before, uh, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, thanks, Ross. Um... Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, and um, I guess there's a few different a few different ways to kind of speculate as to why that might be the case. Um, potentially, what you what you're seeing is just a massive outpouring of detrital sedimentation. So potentially, you're overwhelming um, any orthogenic signal there during the actual proper deglaciation. Um, 
Another explanation could be that, you know, the uh, stratification that is predicted by some models, ocean stratification predicted by some models might um, kind of inhibit the, um, the processes that are uh, kind of presented in this model. So what, what I liked about this model is that what you have this really strong redox gradient between oxygenated, well, if, if we take the assumption that the meltwater is oxygenated and there's a few assumptions involved in that, um, if we take the assumption that they are, then what you're getting is this kind of direct delivery of these oxygenated meltwaters into the um, really anoxic seawater. And that at other times, you know, including during deglaciation, when you have, um, you know, uh, the conditions are quite different that you, you might not have that really strong redox front that uh, might be required to precipitate iron formations. But yeah, it's, it's a good question. And another big question is, you know, why you don't see them in, um, in other ice ages as well. Redox front, I like it, thanks. Good, uh, okay, uh, Paul has hand up, uh, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, in the Maranon glaciation in Namibia, uh, the stratified diamictite that member that's right at the top at the end of the glaciation, the Batani member, which uh, we believe is associated with the, the deglaciation, uh, that diamict is uh, much more iron rich than any of the previous ones. And also, as Ben Johnson can uh, enlarge upon, the nitrogen isotopes are different, indicating a different redox situation uh, during the deglaciation as compared with the uh, uh, the ongoing snowball. That's the American. Yeah, looking at the looking at the uh, the diamictite geochemistry is is really interesting as well. Like uh, as I, yeah, I, I incidentally have sample sets from the Batani from this uh, terminal deglaciation member and comparable facies earlier on. And uh, the sample sets are, are sitting at Harvard and they're available for to anyone who wants to work on the redox uh, chemistry. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, as I said, some of these diamectites can be really iron rich in the matrix. So um, potentially that's something that's also been um, underappreciated is that you, you know, they're not strictly iron formations, but you know, they are, they contain a lot of iron. But chocolate brown. Diamond. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I think Grant Young was saying that almost every uh, diamond diet iron rich, uh, um, but it, it's still not necessary iron formation. But I, I'm wondering uh, maybe the reason why Stushin has iron formation and Marino doesn't is a duration. Uh, so this long duration, if you have any Lachignes provinces or hydrothermal events, or even just through mid-ocean circulation, over that long time, you release so much iron that you would have iron formation after it. And uh, Tony, uh, uh, Marino is shorter and uh, was smaller flux of iron. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, good. It, it looks like there's a question from Alex. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, do you have any gluconite associated with the Tonian einstones? Um, the answer, no. Um, in that there's not, there's definitely not a lot. Um, it's, I found the XRD work to be quite difficult um, on these, you know, kind of complicated um, iron clays. And I'm not seeing an added signal, but in the electron microprobe work, there are some results that potentially are consistent with a little bit of gluconite in there. So, um, uh, you know, that would be something interesting to do in terms of see if you can do any kind of mineral separation or something to try and tease out that, that gluconite signal. And it's interesting because in phanerozoic einstones, um, they often are associated with gluconite and, um, and some of the, um, you know, uh, um, some of the work, uh, like Brooke Johnson's work on the Sherwin einstone, I think showed gluconite as well. So, yeah. But you're definitely not seeing it in as a major rock forming mineral like you do in some other stones. Uh, 
Okay, uh, uh, Alex said, uh, uh, go to it. Thanks, Max. Uh, any other questions for Max or comments or anything? Okay, looks like uh, everyone convinced or at least uh, uh, happy with your answers. Uh, so we uh, take a break and uh, uh, we should have a, a seminar next week. Uh, and uh, we will, Alex and I will start putting a schedule for 2023. Uh, so some of you uh, will be contacted. Uh, um, uh, we will ask if you want to present. And also uh, we have a list of people that people suggested to talk, but if you think uh, there is somebody you would like uh, to listen to, please, uh, I will send email, send email to Alex and me, and we will add it to this list. So thanks again, and uh, see you next week. Bye. Yeah, thanks so much, Andre and Alex, for organizing this. Uh, I know it's a lot of work, and thanks everyone for for coming to my talk, especially those who are up up early or up late. Uh, thanks, Max. It was excellent. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Good to see Tony Spencer. <laughs> yeah.